I'll just let it hang there. This is what they call the earring look. 19 years ago, I was given the privilege of having a sabbatical provided by the diocese and the parish at All Saints in Miami. Ten weeks of that time I spent at St. George's College in Jerusalem. They call it a college, but it's really a continuing education center. And this was their long course of ten weeks. It was a wonderful experience. We traveled down to Egypt, the Sinai Peninsula, and all throughout the Holy Land, and even the island of Cyprus. Most of the members of the group were Anglicans or Roman Catholics, and I think there was one Presbyterian, but most of us were Anglicans or Roman Catholics. And one of the members of our group was a, a, an Episcopal priest who pastored a parish in Florida. And he told me that Lesbia Scott was a member of his congregation. Now, those of you who were here on All Saints Sunday a few weeks ago might remember that in passing, I said that the song, I sing a song of the saints of God, always sounded to me like it was written by a Brit. But the priest had told me that this lady was a member of his congregation in Florida. Well, people move. Because, in fact, she was British, and she grew up in Britain and had uh, her children there, and she wrote many children's songs, including the one that has the words that sound so much like a scene out of Britain. The second half of the third verse where it says, you can meet them in school or in lanes or at sea, in church or in trains or in shops or at tea, for the saints of God are just folks like you and me, and I want to be one too. So I just wanted to set the record straight. <laughs> it does have English roots, which makes sense to me now. After the end of World War I, Pope Pius in 1922 was aware that Europe seemed to be terribly depressed and economically depressed, and life was rather glum. And he thought that the people needed to be reminded that Jesus Christ is the King of all creation. And so he set aside the last Sunday of October to be Christ the King Sunday. It was celebrated for a few years that way, and then in 1925, it was moved to the last Sunday of the season of ordinary time, as we call it, the season right before Advent begins, the Sunday before Advent begins. But Pope Pius said these words, for Jesus Christ reigns over the minds of individuals by his teachings, in their hearts by his love, in each one's life by the living according to his laws and the imitating of his example. So he thought it was important for people to be reminded that in spite of all the troubles and trials and turmoils of the times, Christ was the king of all creation. Our prayer book picked up this observance because those of us who grew up with the 1928 prayer book know that there was no celebration of Christ the king. But the 1979 prayer book that we sometimes call the new prayer book, even though we've had it now for 30 years, 40 years. And so that's why we celebrate it today is because it's now a part of our lectionary cycle. And each year the reading on Christ the King Day is different. 
This year, the setting is from Matthew's gospel, and it is the setting of the great judgment. When Christ sits on his throne and separates the sheep from the goats and describes the things that people did or did not do, because those things are a manifestation of our life in Christ. And he lists six things. I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was a stranger, I was naked, I was sick, and I was a prisoner. Those six things have long been called the corporal works of mercy. Corporal meaning, of course, body works of mercy. And these are the kinds of things that we as Christians have done for a very long time. It could almost lead one to believe that one is justified for salvation through good works. But that is not the point at all. It is simply that those good works that we do are a manifestation of who we are. Not, we don't do them in order to gain access to heaven. We do them because it's natural for us to do those things, to reach out to those who, who are in need of various kinds of corporal mercy. And I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about the last one. You visited me while I was in prison. I don't know how aware you are of the prison ministry that is done in this diocese. It's remarkable how many people are involved who go on a regular basis to the various prisons to minister to those who are in prison. And the way I got started in this was while I was still in Miami, the ministerial alliance decided that they wanted to offer worship services in the county jail and that had have churches take responsibility for those services. And so I gathered together a small group of us who were approved to go into the jail and we would do a service there. Most of the time it was not a communion service. We, we might do morning prayer or evening prayer or Compline or something like that. But that, we got started because back in those days, George Day, a deacon in Oklahoma City, was very involved in prison ministry. And there were a couple of women who had been sent from Mabel Bassett Prison up to the Ottawa County Jail for a time. And they had let George know that they would like to have somebody from the Episcopal Church come and meet with them. And that was the beginning. And I remember in a phone call after getting started with that, I said to George, you know, th these seem like just regular people. He said, they are regular people. <laughs> They're just people that got into trouble, <laughs> made some bad choices or whatever got them there. And once we got doing that, like on a monthly basis, we never ever knew anything about what it was that brought these people to that place. And that wasn't our purpose. We didn't need to know that. They never volunteered it. We never asked. We went in to try to minister to them in their time of need. And that goes on constantly in this diocese. And there are many of them who are in prison who say they are so grateful for the Episcopal Church's service because it's not all hellfire and damnation. They know what that feels like. They've been judged already, and they don't need to hear that again. They need to hear of the love of God. And they're so grateful for our services because we bring in something that's peaceful and quiet and loving and not judgmental. So that's one way in which People in our diocese are ministering to those in prison. And of course, we know of many places where people or our churches feed the hungry, provide a clothes closet for people who need clothing. 
welcoming the stranger, and giving something to drink. I was just reminded of a time when there was a, a parade in Chicago, and one of the bishops was walking along with bottles of water, just giving people water, giving a cup of cold water. That's the kind of thing that we do because it flows out of us naturally, not for us to try to gain eternal life. We're already promised that. But because we are the people of God, those are the kinds of things that we do in the name of Christ in order to live out our ministries in his name. Amen.